this series is for you. Uh, uh, we at Compliance Group are just merely sponsoring this. But again, we really want your feedback, your input on the information that Melissa and Ron are going to show you today from Johnson & Johnson. We really do highly recommend that you ask questions as we go along. We will make sure that we leave time at the very end uh, to go through the questions that you that you ask us. If we don't have time to answer all the questions, we'll make sure to get back to you uh, uh, after today's uh, webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Chris. I'm your host today from Compliance Group. I have with us today Ron, Melissa, and Khaled. So let's go ahead and get started with intros and we'll uh, we'll dig into the meat of today's webinar session. Our guest today, Ron Chardong from Johnson & Johnson. He is the lead technology quality group responsible for computerized systems validation of business applications in the medical devices, consumer and pharmaceutical segments worldwide. He has over 25 years of experience, which means Ron, you're what, 29 years old? Um, in quality engineering, supplier quality, uh, auditing, management, regulatory compliance, and regulatory affairs. Uh, he is also a member of the FIXA team, which is the FDA industry CSA team. We also have Melissa Vasquez. Melissa is the technology quality manager at Johnson & Johnson, responsible for computer system validation, quality oversight uh, within the manufacturing execution systems, which is also known as MES globally for medical device, consumer, and pharmaceutical segments. She has over 20 years of experience, which Melissa, you, Europe must be 29 as well, um, in software quality, engineering, auditing, technical writing, uh, training, uh, spanning across manufacturing, laboratory, clinical, and quality systems. And last but not least, we have Mr. Khaled Musali, the Executive Vice President at Compliance Group. He's a thought leader in providing cutting edge solutions in the life sciences industry. He has over 25 years of experience. So Khaled, I'll give you maybe age 30, um, in, the IT <laughs> in the IT manufacturing quality space. Uh, he transitioned into consulting uh, to bring the paradigm shift within quality and, and compliance by leveraging his experience uh, with regulatory agencies. He is also a member of the FIXA, which is the FDA industry CSA team. Uh, and he's also on the ISPE GAMP uh, steering committee as well. Khaled, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. I appreciate it. Just a note on the age thing. Uh, the reason why you see some gray hair is because of computer system validation. So that's why I decided to start this entire thing about CSA, because I want people to look just like Ron and Melissa, young and fresh. All right, uh, let me take you on to the uh, to our agenda here. So basically for those of you who's, uh, who've attended uh, our webinars, uh, uh, webinar series before, or at least uh, you know episode one, and this is episode two. Uh, really, the idea is to hear directly from the FDA industry CSA team, which I will explain a little bit um, later who they are. Uh, of course, Ron is uh, one of them, and Melissa is a champion or an extended team member. I would call her at this point because she's very much engaged and adapted CSA. Uh, we'll also talk about the 2020 webinar series schedule and why we're doing it. And then we'll hear uh, definitely Johnson Johnson CSA journey and a case study specifically on the manufacturing execution system and other uh, projects that uh, Johnson & Johnson are working on. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about next steps. We'll leave that as a surprise. So really the objectives of these series is uh, many of you probably have heard about CSA, Computer Software Assurance. Um, and there is a lingering FDA draft guidance waiting out there to be, relieved, uh, to be released that as a team, we put a lot of recommendation into that guidance and we're waiting for the release. The idea is at the end of this uh, webinar series or this episode, do not wait uh, for the draft guidance to be released uh, because you'll know why. Uh, you can start implementing, start thinking about implementing today. Um, Pilot studies are definitely effective. Digitize your current paper CSA. Please get off paper. Do not be afraid from automation. That's really my message to you. And of course, create awareness to accelerate innovation that ties back to digitize your current paper CSA process and then inspire action so you can begin to realize the value which Ron and Melissa will be talking about shortly. A uh, little bit about the uh, uh, the uh, schedule here. So uh, we have three more uh, episodes coming up. The idea is we're supposed to have about 15 of them, uh, but the rest will be uh, announced at a later time as I get commitment from these folks. And uh, 
please uh, register. Uh, there's, this is a link here where you can register for episode three with Fresenius. Uh, this is going to be a very exciting one. Not that this one won't be as exciting, but um, we're going to have the folks that actually started it all, started the entire Fixa team, uh, started the idea of CSA. So um, here I have invited, um, as invited guests, uh, Cisco Vicente and Jason Spiegler, who promised to show up. So we'll see, but we definitely going to have Bill uh, Dennis Enzo and Mark Cotter from Fresenius to tell us all about it. And Bill has been uh, just, I call him the founder. He doesn't want me to call him the founder, but he was one of the founders that really helped push uh, the, 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 the CSA forward. Uh, just to give you a little bit background for those of you, again, who's just joining us, I know many of you are repeat, and I'm glad to uh, to see that. But for those of you who just joined us, uh, please uh, go visit and watch the Game Changer Kickoff webinar with Cisco, myself, and Stephen Cook uh, from Compliance Group. Um, uh, listen to Cisco's. Uh, please see the material and also the white paper that Compliance Group has issued. Um, uh, it, it kind of give you the baseline for all of these series and why we're doing them. This is the team, the FDA industry CSA team. As you can see, there is uh, pharma, uh, biotech, medical device folks, very smart folks from uh, various companies, uh, managers and above uh, have been uh, involved in the computer system validation world for many years. And they're all thirsty to come up with recommendation uh, to really streamline the validation process that we've been kind of struggling for over 20 plus years. So that's the team. Uh, we do have uh, a, uh, a LinkedIn group uh, that feel free to join. Um, and uh, we will kind of give you always updates on what's coming up uh, in regard to the guidance and regarding to other examples that the team's been working on. Computer Software Assurance. I will not go in so much details here, but the five things that you need to know, and then I will definitely hand it over to uh, um, uh, Ron and uh, Melissa. So computer software assurance, it comes really from multi-year collaboration uh, between the FDA and the industry, and you saw the team behind it. There's a lot more folks that have come and gone, but we always have these fresh ideas. Uh, ideas about how to streamline the validation process, how to how to stay away from the, the, the documentation that has been really hindering us from innovating. Um, the idea is to go risk-based on the impact to patient safety and product quality. Today, when we work on, uh, on any system, when we assess any system or requirements, everything is high, everything is critical. The idea is to really switch that from that typical FMEA that takes forever to get done and work uh, and, and focus on uh, patient safety and product quality. Uh, it calls for the least burdensome documentation approach. So the idea behind it, yes, we want to do more testing and less documentation. And uh, I'm sure Melissa will speak to that. Introduce paperwork by uh, or uh, reduces paperwork by 80% by introducing what we call an unscripted and ad hoc testing. And in, in, uh, as a result, this will result really in less issue in documentation and production. Last but not least, and this is for the credibility of CSA, it's not only that FDA considering it, ISPE GAM basically stated and sponsor it, this is what we've been recommending for the past 20 plus years folks in the industry how come you haven't listened yet so i'll leave you with that thought i will skip this and i will turn it on to my friend uh, ron from uh, the fixer team just a quick uh, again thank you for inviting us for this uh, for this series and i want to start by just just walking through a little bit of our journey with the uh, the, with the industry and fda consortium uh, with fixa and then i have a few Pointers that I would like to, again, some reminders for folks, some clarification, and then I'll pass it on to Melissa, which will walk, probably that's one of the main reasons why you wanted to join this is to uh, to actually hear the details about our our pilot that we have done. So we we joined the the, uh, the consortium about two years ago, 
And at first, as, as a consortium, we wanted to put together some case studies and share them with the industry about different interpretations and approaches for software validation. And then this turned into the the idea for a guidance document, and uh, and eventually that 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 was the, the 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 pivoting point. So the challenge is like, how do you know if something is working when you're putting some again trying to change things? So we as as a group actually decided to use the approach the approach of test and learn, and we all did pilots. So today we'll share with you the results of uh, of, of our pilot which we started with one and then uh, two more were added as people saw the full value of CSA, well, what CSA can bring. So before I do that, I just have like, a few pointers I wanted to make. So uh, one of them is that CSA is not a full SDLC. So I think you need to go in with your eyes wide open. And again, there are numerous sources of, again, guidance and other things such as GAMP5 that will tell you about the entire life cycle for software development, infrastructure, and end-to-end -end management of your application, such as backup, restore, incidents, change control, disaster recovery, and et cetera. So again, this CSA is not intended to necessarily address all of those. Uh, also, CSA is, is not focused on product software. So again, if you're doing software as a medical device or software in a medical device, uh, you still need to, again, to apply the principles in uh, design controls, uh, again, if you're a, a medical device manufacturer. So we have, I think, historically treated business applications, tools, and automation as a product and have been, like, again, trying to validate it to the same level that you would do for a product. But I think we need to keep in mind that in many cases, we are really dealing with business applications and uh, I think we have to apply the principles of having direct or indirect impact to patient quality, product safety, uh, some of the regulatory compliance elements, as well as uh, data integrity. Another thing, again, just as a, as a reminder here, is that many times in like recent conversations I have heard where people say like unscripted testing, so that means I have no documentation. And this is a, a misconception. Uh, unscripted testing just means that you don't have a script telling you type this, click here, enter that. So unscripted testing still involves some level of documentation. Uh, you still need to have a test objective, like who did it and when, uh, did it pass or fail, were there any bugs or defects, and uh, again, how you handle those. And you still have likely a tra trace matrix to uh, again to go from your requirements and where they were tested. Another aspect of the, again, as part of the reminders is leveraging a software vendor. Uh, so there are many consulting companies out there advertising that they can make a CSA compliant and they will do the vendor audits or assessments for you. That to me is the equivalent to watching the uh, cooking network uh, channel all day long and then cooking the same lousy meal. Yeah, you don't need to have, essentially, you need to have a, a plan on how you will leverage the vendor's information. So just doing a, an audit or assessment for the sake of assessment is not really get you very far. So you really need to apply critical thinking and see how you can do that and, and, and then plan your audit or assessment around that. Another topic or, or item that I want to touch on very briefly is about barriers and, and objections. And so we'd like to need, they need to know your base. Uh, as you're having conversations within your organization, you're thinking about, again, putting into practice some of the principles in CSA, probably the first objection is gonna be with your own. And again, if you are in quality compliance or regulatory, uh, some of your own colleagues will say, oh, it's not a final guidance. We will not implement it until it's final because auditors or inspectors will give us observations. And I think, yeah, again, with, with a few other points that I have here, I think it will help in, in, in making the argument for that. But one thing that is very important here is that CSA is not creating any new regulation, right? It's simply a change in the interpretation of existing regulation and treating business applications as business applications and not treating that as a product. And also bringing things to the 21st century and really using technology advancements and risk management principles as part of your assurance program. Uh, CSA focuses on the on the applications intended use, which again, th there is no change there. Uh, 
uh, also deals with the direct or indirect uh, risk to patient safety, product quality, uh, quality system, and also data integrity. And here I'm speaking for, again, from my perspective, our perspective in J&J, again, as a global company that operates in medical devices, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, and some other products, uh, we have a broad base of regulators that uh, inspect or audit us on a regular basis. So the changes that we are making, uh, again, we have to keep that in mind so that we are not going too far in one direction and then get ourselves in trouble. So for us, maybe compared to, a, uh, to other companies, some of the changes might be a little bit slower, but we have to, again, keep our, our base in mind. So, uh, and then the other one is, uh, I think Colin mentioned, that, like right now, the, it, it is very much like people see that as it being US and FDA focused, uh, but there is also work with GAMP to include potentially like an annex to uh, on CSA. Uh, so what you see in CSA is mostly mentioned uh, like in passing as part of GAMP 5. Uh, and what CSA does is just to expand on those principles. And what are we doing to prepare for the re release of CSA? So many of the principles and practices you will see in uh, Melissa's presentation today are already uh, being used inside of J&J. Many are not new, as you will see, but we don't always use them consistently. So part of it is just using some of these things and principles consistently. Uh, the other aspect of it is we actually have four initiatives going on right now to really expand on, on CSA's principles. So we have one of the initiatives around testing. Uh, the other one is around vendor assessment and how we can leverage uh, vendor information as part of our assurance program. One is for COTS, uh, commercial off-the-shelf software. And again, some are of low risk uh, no immediate uh, risk to patient safety or, or product safety. And so I think we need to sometimes have uh, a more tailored approach to some of those things. And last but not least is the end-to-end -end risk management. Uh, I think uh, many risk management programs are very focused on, on FMEA. So the tool drives the process and doesn't necessarily drive to critical thinking. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we're also hopeful that GAMP will come out with the, uh, the CSA appendix uh, as part of one of the uh, good guidance practices. Uh, and that might even come out before the FDA publishes the, uh, the guidance. So I think it will help in, uh, in, uh, in adoption. So without further ado, I think this is what you all came for, which was to, to hear some of the details from our uh, pilot. So I'll, like Melissa, I will drive the slides for you and, uh, and Welcome. Thank you, Ron, and thank you for this opportunity to present our pilot here today on CSA. And I would like to start with the strategy. As like with any new project, as was the pilot and the deployment of those MES systems. And when you're incorporating from a new source, we started at this point, the strategy. So the technology quality team translated the concepts of CSA, of the FDA draft guidance, and also defined the strategy for its adoption within J&J, as well as leading the efforts from a, a quality and compliance perspective. So as Ron mentioned, there were three sites, started with one, two other sites wanted to join in, there was some excitement there, so we ended with three sites in scope of the pilot. The efforts were staggered. They took a period over a year and it had multiple cross-functional teams, IT, business, supply chain, quality, local, global quality, technology quality, right? So the first step was here, the definition of our strategy. It focused on the intended use. Next, and using Agile CSV as opposed to the traditional waterfall approach. It followed a risk-based approach, focusing on those elements and those functions that were critical to quality and applying critical thinking to the end-to-end -end validation process. It had two levels of assurance testing activities, baseline assurance referring more to those supplier uh, validation uh, done by the supplier and a global effort that we had in-house. 
and free space assurance where we introduce some of those um, testing assurance activities from the draft guidance, such as ad hoc testing and unscripted testing that Khaled mentioned before. Evidence and records, focusing more on electronic or digital type of records versus no paper and introducing tools that we had uh, like agile tools for requirements and test management versus those papers, traditional way of documenting the testing. So here is where I'm gonna present most of the activities, the most significant ones. Can you understand uh, going over a year period with so with the three different sites, there were so many activities. So we have summarized the most significant ones. The table here is gonna present the different CSV activities, a pre-pilot state, a post-pilot state, and results for each one of these activities. So starting with the requirements or user stories, as we call it in Agile, the pre-pilot state for these sites, all three, was paper-based. Post-pilot, we introduced JIRA to manage the requirements. And as positive on the results, we were able to standardize the format for these user stories. And we were able to automate it um, and lead into the subsequent stages because they had an automatic feed with our test management tool, uh, HPLM. Moving on to the risk assessment, again, in the pre-pilot state for all three sites, it was paper-based. Not only was it paper-based, is that each site had different CSV approaches for managing risk. So we were able to post-pilot have these sites in JIRA, so electronically manage it and also use the CSV framework, which are standard procedures for a risk-based approach. And on top of that, we were able to incorporate risk concepts from CSA. So on the results, we could see that we were able to combine and streamline deliverables and the approvals instead of having separate deliverables, uniting the requirements and the risk assessment. And we were able to tailor as uh, so subsequent assurance activities based on those built on risk assessment uh, strategy. In terms of baseline assurance, um, pre pilot being a regulated company, uh, there is supplier qualification taking place. Post pilot, what we were able to do was make a better use of that supplier qualification so that we could leverage more of that validation type of activities being done by the supplier. Plus the global team that we have for MES also leveraged those. So those activities would not be duplicated in any of the deployments at the sites. So in, in terms of the results and the positive end, well, is the better use of, of that supplier qualification and the vendor validation and the global validation to reduce site activities for their implementation. If we move on to the installation qualification, um, this is one that I, I, I really like to report on. Pre-pilot, um, we have a mature program with MES. So we had data in which it would take about four weeks for the execution of the installation qualification. The scripts, um, the approach was scripted for the testing and it was fully paper-based. Post-pilot for these three sites, we were able to reduce that to two weeks. We introduced some scripted testing where it was possible and electronic um, test management tool, HPLM. So we were able to observe as the result a 50% reduction on that testing and a reduction in all of the manual activities associated with documenting um, paper type of scripting, the scanning, the attachments, the cross-referencing, the cross-linking. And I'm happy to report that after the pilot, which we continue to always look into um, enhancing, improving, right, more introducing more efficiencies, we were able to automate now um, 
for the pilot, we had five that we did on scripted. Now we have six automated scripts. So there is additional functionality from the, win from the vendor Windows PowerShell and the reductions are even greater now. Moving on to the one on import configuration verification. The MES type of systems, our systems are highly configurable, right? So when we are applying CSA, one of the important aspects of it is to apply critical thinking. By that, you look at your end-to-end -end process for validation, and you, a, you are able to identify together in collaboration with your team, with your SMEs, um, areas where you can introduce these deficiencies applying CSA. One of our pain points and uh, for MES, and I think for highly configurable systems too, is the configuration. So pre-pilot, it took about 10 days. Um, it was all formal testing, all scripted. No, uh, there was no leveraging of the development testing. We didn't have any um, site specific type of guidance um, for the teams on the configuration, and it was fully paper based. Post pilot, we were able to reduce that to one day. How did we manage that? So we introduced ad hoc testing and unscripted testing. We also were able to create a guideline on site-specific configuration so that we could identify those objects that were of high criticality as compared to those that were medium and low. By doing that, it's not that we did less assurance testing, is that 100% of the assurance testing done in development was leveraged. So when we move into quality, into the qualify environment, we focus the formal documentation and testing to those elements that we had identified as being of high to, or critical to quality. So we were able to reduce our formal testing to 10%. Okay. We did. Um, a great amount of testing. We just reduce the formal documentation of it and be ad hoc testing leverage what we had done in development. Thank you. So moving on to system testing. All of these three implementations initially were out of the box implementations. So pre-pilot for out of the box implementation, there was functional testing um, being done at the global level fully. Um, and it was on paper base and it was completely um, scripted, right? Um, there was, in this case, for the ERP interface that was to be introduced. Post pilot, we apply critical thinking again. So let's evaluate our criteria, right, that we have. We have a mature vendor with an established uh, report with j, j We have a mature global team, and we're deploying an out-of-the-box application. So in terms of functional testing for out-of-the-box functions, what we were able to do was 100% leverage what the global validation team had previously conducted uh, with previous versions, plus the validation and the qualification and the supplier uh, qualification that we had done with the vendor. So we reduced that 100%, um, except for ERP, right? It was an interface and it had customization, so there it would have to be um, fully validated by us. In terms, it, did we do no testing? No, it doesn't mean we didn't test those functions that were critical to quality to us. What we did was that we focused those towards the user acceptance testing, which moves me on to the next um, activity, user acceptance testing. So pre-pilot, user acceptance testing was fully robust scripting, which is very detailed. And the testing focused on intended use, yes. But in terms of MES for you have to build workflows for your manufacturing and the operations. 
all of the workflows were tested. So we saw the pilot as a unique opportunity to further streamline another area. We evaluated where we would do even ad hoc or unscripted um, for, for UAT, but we decided against that. Why? We had three new sites going fully from paper batch records to implementing MES for the first time, users that weren't experiencing the application. So we went with limited scripting wherever possible so that we still introduced a level of streamlining, but we were able to provide the instructions and the directions that new users needed in order to be able to execute the testing. One other thing that we were able to do there was the workflows, where we previously tested them all. No, now we did an analysis across all of the workflows. In MES, you could be creating workflows for different type of product families. And the, the operations could be the same across. So why are we going to test those across 20? If I test them across five and I'm addressing the 20, regardless of the product line that I'm bringing in, right? So we were able also to reduce significantly um, the testing assurance activities by applying critical thinking to the workflows that will really require testing, which will have different operations within that. Moving on to the next activity, defects, errors, incidents. Pre-pilot, paper-based again, and there was a lot of um, extensive documentation, cross-referencing, scanning going with this by introducing an automated testing tool being HPLM, we, and also JIRA, uh, that we were gonna track issues, we were able to significantly reduce the number of defects to what we're calling non-value added um, regarding like script, uh, script errors type. If you are reducing your, or, or introducing new type of testing activities like ad hoc and unscripted, now you're able to reduce all of those non-value added errors for script errors, for example. Okay, another opportunity was in changes and upgrades. So whenever you have one of these deployments, there's a period that you're vigilant because um, although we would like everything to be 100% effective and nothing to come up, ah, things come up and changes need to be introduced. So Pre-pilot, when changes were going to be introduced, it was completely scripted, um, paper-based, and protocols and reports needed to be created. Post-pilot, we saw opportunities for um, more flexibility to be added here to quickly introduce this and address it and focus on the assurance activities that needed to take place for those changes. So we use limited scripted and unscripted wherever applicable. We uh, introduce um, for these sites, uh, a good point here, um, HPLM, um, which I mentioned before for test management, but ClearQuest. All of them have paper-based type of processes for managing their changes. So we were able to introduce also another application, ClearQuest, which is the change management application in-house. And for the protocols and reports, we didn't create those separate. What we used was the change request itself to document the strategy up front and approve it. And then with the closure of the, of the um, change request, we, we closed the reporting part of it too. So we leveraged that instead of creating separate deliverables. And moving on now to uh, Agile concepts. So all along, you have heard me paper, and then we introduced tools. Um, it's also the Agile methodology. So these three sites were following prior to this uh, pilot, a more traditional waterfall approach. While in J&J, we have Agile CSV, and we introduced them to Agile CSV plus the tools that we use in Agile CSV. 
So instead of following that completely sequential approach, uh, like documenting all encompassive requirements, and then moving on to the next sequence of deliverables in that sequence, we evaluated then again um, that part of the process and what activities we could conduct in parallel, right? Together with the team and putting mitigation risk in place. So, and allowing, for example, IQ activities to be happening in production that already had taken off the OB application, that already had taken place in QA, right? And while that's taking place, I could be conducting a performance test, for example, in parallel. Um, we also, and let me see what else I can uh, The combination of deliverables, like I mentioned before, um, by introducing these agile tools, we have um, the URS and the risk assessment that we have built in into our, into our JIRA tool, that is a combined deliverable. So the signatures are combined. And all in one delivery. No, no, the Agile allows you to do iterations. So you're able to deliver MVP. So you're able to determine that um, a product that could deliver value to them. In our case, we configure. So instead of configuring all the product lines and then deliver, we see what product line we could configure and then deliver that while we continue working on the next phase. So here, executive summary. So I could tell you that the MES pilot proved to be was a significant step towards streamlining the CSV documentation and reducing the formal testing. And this is a step towards enabling high quality manufacturing and speed to value delivery. So the right panel here shows you results um, that we observe for documentation and we observe a reduction in the time, in the papers and manual errors, signatures and approvals by the combination of those. And on the positive side, we observe an increase in the use of the automation tools I've been mentioning here, HBLM, IL, ClearQuest. Uh, and these provide an increase on visibility, a standardization across, a capability to leverage from one effort to the other, they were staggered to learn lessons, to have the visibility across. So it increased overall efficiency of the execution of that documentation. On the right panel, we could see the results will serve for testing, will serve um, a, a decrease in the cycle time um, and testing configuration and development and an ability to leverage from the development uh, and installation uh, reduction, as I mentioned before, 50% and even greater after the pilot by introducing automation. And I mentioned the non-value added type of defects and unnecessary tedious steps. Um, we observe on the positive, uh, positive side, sorry, uh, an increase on the critical to quality uh, testing analysis and critical thinking, applying that in collaboration with your SMEs across the process to streamline and to refocus the assurance activities. So an increase in, as I mentioned, that development, testing, leveraging it and configuration, um, parallel activities, increase those, a better use of the SMEs. Now they don't have to be focused on documenting, extensive documentation, their focus where they, they add the value, that assurance activities, even in development, even in a, a documenting everything, but they're, they're focused there in making sure that I'm delivering a product with quality and then reducing what I really um, formally will document to demonstrate the activities that I have completed. And then by introducing IO methods, IO concepts, IO tools, we also had with the daily stand up a dedicated team. So we saw an increase in the synergy of the team and their ability to be able to respond. So this concludes my presentation on our pilot. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. So I'll pass the ball on to uh, Khaled.
Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Uh, every word you said, Melissa, was literally music to my ear. This is what we've been practically saying in every webinar at every conference. We're talking about, you know, not to be afraid to, to strategize. I love how you started with a strategy. Think of CSA as a strategy. Forget about the draft guidance, literally. Forget about what ISPE GAN says. It's your strategy. You're gonna state your strategy, your validation strategy, and you're gonna go for it. You mentioned automation, loved it. Every time you mentioned the, mod mod you know, the automation, it's just like literally music to my ear. Get off paper, leverage as much as you can. You mentioned HBLM, you know, we, we work with Polarian, for example. It's a great tool. Use tools to, to really advance and speed up that project. And the reason why um, in my last life, when I was with Baxter, every IT vice president talking about why is validation costing me close to 50% to validate a system? Well, there's something fundamentally wrong with that picture. So thank you, thank you again. Um, to Ron's point, he mentioned something about CSA is not SDLC. And I agree. CSA is a concept, is a strategy. You need to maintain your software development lifecycle. You need to maintain, you know, you still need to use your requirements, your design spec, depending on the system that you're working on, out of the box, configurable, custom. Um, another thing he mentioned, uh, unscripted, is not equivalent to no documentation. Please understand, when we're talking about unscripted or ad hoc or limited unscripted, you are still providing evidence, Ex except you're not doing that click by click and every single step, and I know Melissa talked about it, they minimize the test script error by far. So the idea is you still need to have a, a form for your unscripted or your ad hoc stating what the objective of that test case, right? You still need to map it to your requirement. You need to build it into your trace matrix. So it's it's very important that you continue to do these things. So we're not saying CSA is equivalent to no documentation, okay? Um, the other thing, um, and I know we had a question actually, we'll, we'll get to the Q&A uh, about how you leverage your development. <clears throat> and uh, actually Chris asked for that. Um, uh, also, uh, thank you Juan for mentioning the appendix uh, that we worked on myself, uh, Ken uh, Shitamoto, and Sento uh, from the FDA CSA industry team. We worked together with the ISPE GAMP to provide them uh, uh, information on CSA. Uh, that appendix will be part of a GDG data integrity by design. And yes, the hope is to have it sometime late fall. So it might be before the FDA drive guidance, which we don't know if it's gonna be rele released this year, but that should not stop, stop you from thinking about uh, implementing CSA. Johnson & Johnson just gave us a great example and thank you very much for that. Thank you again, folks. Um, we had quite a few questions that have come in, so we'll do our best to answer as many as we can within the next 15 minutes or so. Okay, and this question could be for Ron and I. So DMS, Document Management System, is a non-product category, but if it has, uh, but it's having, if it has documents that support manufacturing or any process having direct impact on product quality, patient safety, would it be considered indirect? How will CSA help? So I would, again, uh, every company usually has a form of uh, evaluating any new application that is being introduced. And, and so we, we have a process we call the compliance analysis where we evaluate the, the intended use of the application that is documented. So then based on the intended use, you determine your, your strategy for, for validation. So uh, yes, it's important to, to again, identify so using this example as a document management system, and again, take it with a grain of salt, right? I, I don't know the specifics, so I'm not here like setting any rules, but just uh, it's more of a topic of conversation. So uh, with the information that is provided, I would say, again, if it has likely indirect impact to patient, just because again, depending what type of records you're gonna have in there, 
it has some components let's say if you have uh, electronic signatures and these are your electronic records and it is your source of truth so you again they you do you do have uh, components that are related to your uh, just meeting some regulatory requirements but indirect impact to patient so uh, yeah I would say it is it is of a lower risk than something that is like it has a direct impact so I think that lends itself as an opportunity for using uh, again maybe you have some key functionality in there let's say your vendor is the first time that they're doing uh, part 11 signatures so you don't really have a history there. So you might have to do some scripted testing for, for those, some of those, those uh, uh, features. But for some of the other items, uh, you might again have the opportunity to use uh, unscripted or ad hoc. So I, I, again, it's, it's hard to get to a lot of specifics. So like again, this is, is a general example. But I, again, I think you do have the opportunity to look at this as a business application and not as a product. So I know historically, most companies have just done, everything is scripted and everything has a screenshot. And, uh, and many times, if you look at your, many of your defects uh, is because it's either was a, a, uh, a tester error or you have poorly written script, or sometimes both, and you have defects. But so a lot of the effort is around trying to address those, but you're really not testing the application itself and see that it does what you want it to do for you. So I think this provides that opportunity to focus more on testing the application, making sure that you have a good product, that it does what it's supposed to do for you and not spending like spinning the wheels and, and doing documentation that might not necessarily add any value. So I hope I somewhat address your question because it is generic, but again, it definitely through CSA and, I, and you probably have seen a table that has been published uh, through like speeches where like Khaled and Ken and uh, Cisco and uh, Jason, they have done like speeches in other places, other webinars. So there is a table. We actually had it as part of ours. We took it out just to, for the sake of time, but it goes through. The material. Yes, it is part of the materials that is here. Uh, but I kind of like, it walks you through a little bit again, based on, on risk. Uh, what kind of testing you could use and what kind of evidence you would use for that. So I think that is a good starting point. That's what we use for our pilot was, was something like that to then walk through and decide where we were going to use scripted, unscripted, ad hoc, uh, or leveraging or other kind of like uh, baseline assurances as part of our strategy. So I'll, I'll stop here. Otherwise, I'll consume all the time. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ron. Yeah, this is uh, this is really good. Uh, just to add, really, to what Ron had said. So initially, when we started all the recommendation for the draft guidance, we were just focused on non-product software, and uh, and then later on, uh, uh, as we started discussing it with the FDA, well, this should be really in you know this should include anything within manufacturing and the quality. Uh, system. So therefore, uh, again, uh, the idea is, yes, you, you hear it all over. Yeah, we're going to put CSV behind us and move to CSA. Well, you can't really just cancel CSV, right? So you need to understand CSA is an approach of CSV. Yes, uh, you can apply it. Uh, depends on your culture uh, within your company. Depends on your quality organization, uh, uh, you know, and the relationship and how much they understand it. Um, it, it, it really goes back to your organization on uh, CSA. There is no one size fits all. Everyone is going to apply it differently, and I can guarantee you that. And the idea is we want people to have, you know, that critical thinking mind that uh, Melissa mentioned about. Next question, uh, and this one to Melissa. Uh, Melissa, post production release, did you observe an increase? and or decrease in end user problem tickets? Well, it's not really related to anything. No, no, it's not related to CSA, right? So we have continued to use this within the EMEA space as we documented in strategies. So no, as compared to any previous effort, no. It's, it's not CSA that's gonna introduce those to you, right? We're still doing the testing 
um, what we're not doing is formally documenting everything. We're focusing the formal documentation on those critical to quality elements. Okay. Great, thank you. While I'm with you, I'm going to ask you another question that is for you. How did you leverage development testing when there were no scripts or screenshots? What would be the evidence in case of an audit? Okay, very good. So, configuration testing, I mean, configuration is already happening in development for MES. MES has an import export capability that we have validated already and that it's offered out of the box. So you configure in development and then you import export that into quality and then same from quality into production. So already our configuration team who are the SMEs are doing that configuration now, verifying it before we even do the import export. What we're doing now is leveraging what they have done previously and the checks that they have done and those experts are documenting what we call an ad hoc test of their 100% verification of that configuration before we import that into the quality environment and then we focus the quality environment to the high or critical to quality elements of configuration where we formally document that part on top of what they did yeah great thank you Melissa. so we do retain something for evidence yes it's an ad hoc awesome. test and to melissa's point uh the idea again with csa leverage anything you can leverage uh vendor documentation again leverage don't just refer to it and say they did they tested it leverage verify um, uh, anything you can take credit for, that's the idea of CSA. Anything you can take credit for, take it, document it, stack it up. Uh, the, the most important part is, is you focus on the high risk area and what should really impact patient and product. And call it, if uh, I may expand on, on that one, just, just a tad, which is uh, around the portion on the question for like screenshots. Uh, I think we do screenshots to death, and that's that's my my experience. is like is a it's death by a thousand paper cuts, uh, and that has been the and, and why do we do that? We do that to show as an evidence to to an auditor. But I'll I'll, I'll draw a parallel here. Is like when you are in again like let's use as an example like a manufacturing process. We have operators. On a, on a manufacturing line that we give them instructions on how to assemble or do a part of assembly of a product. And they have a batch history record where they, so they have work instructions they follow, they have training that is done to them, and then they have a batch history record where they will record either sometimes some, some test data that they do, and usually they're testing their own products, not that it's, uh, it's done by a, a quality control unit. And then once they complete their steps, follow their instructions, they basically sign that or, or, or initial that batch history record saying, I did all I need to do, and the product moves down the, uh, the production line. And I'm here talking about it could be a life-saving drug, it could be a life-sustaining medical device, things of, again, a high criticality. And we accept that person's initials or word or whatever to say that, it, it met the acceptance criteria and, and, and can proceed. And for some reason in validation of computerized systems, people's words suddenly like have no value, no meaning. And I think we have to challenge that because again, we don't need, there are certain things that you do need a screenshot because you have a need for, but I think we overuse that as we do it for auditing purposes, but again, what is there a critical need for that? Or is there a need for it? And I think we need, we need to challenge that and compare to other activities that are a lot more critical. Like for example, the example of the manufacturing process, where again, we're not doing like a, in, a, in a production line, having people taking screenshots of, of whatever they did or someone like videotaping, attaching a video for everything that they do. So we have to trust people to do their job. If we gave them the skills and competencies 
and instructions to do their job and they did it and it was good, then let's say that it was good and it moves on. So, sorry, I'm stepping down from my soapbox now. <laughs> and, and can I add something? Can I add no. something to yes, that? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, okay, because yeah, you're leveraging development type of testing, but it doesn't stop there. Then you're doing some type of qualification in, in QA, and you're conducting a user acceptance testing of your end-to-end -end process as you intend for it to go, and you have procedures, and you're training them to those procedures. <laughs> so that's, there's some activities taking place there to ensure. So, so we all, in here in J&J, equality first, right? and our patients and the products that we produce are very important. It's just that, do I generate all of this documentation to demonstrate something, or I generate to ensure I have a higher assurance of what I'm delivering? And the same we do with the system. So that's the way we approach the validation. Awesome, awesome. So are we trying to tell the industry that they're doing way too much today? The answer probably yes. I think we are all, you know, for the past 20 plus years, we're just doing too much. Um, the uh, There's another question here. What do you expect from out of the box software vendor as they introduce new features and functions? Um, I'll, I'll just answer my what I'm thinking and then I'll pass it on to uh, Ron and Melissa. Um, uh, to me, uh, this is just gonna happen a lot more and more, you know, with cloud computing and uh, vendor just um, not installing anything on your infrastructure, everything is remote. So uh, this is another reason why you should go to electronic system, uh, to paperless validation tool. Once you establish something, and again, I wanna talk about Polarian just because I like it, and Polarian has a built-in CSA tool. Now, um, once you establish that baseline, it will be so much easier to append any change of functions or requirement into that. So you don't have to redo all your paperwork all over again. And I'm sure uh, GNJ, they use HPLM, very similar. So I'll pass it on, whoever would like to take that uh, uh, question. Yeah, I know we're like at about time, but just I think briefly, it's uh, similar to your strategy that it would use for software as a service. Uh, I think the, the best thing for industry is to really uh, use like automated testing. So when the vendor is proposing uh, a change to, you, to, to the software that they provide to you, I'm sure they have done a ton of their own testing. It doesn't necessarily test some of your interfaces and some other things that you have, but I believe, again, the use of automated testing will tremendously reduce the work effort and you still have, again, your, your, your results to show that, yes, you, you test and it works. And uh, so I think people have, have to seriously consider use the, uh, the use, consider the use of automated testing. Thank you. Yeah, and now I'll, I'll add to that that also supplier qualifications, right? So based yeah. on your intent of it, also focus your supplier qualification on those elements that are more critical to you Absolutely. to be a, and what's going to give you the confidence to leverage uh, from what the vendor is doing and to duplicate or at least minimize what you're doing how and before that i just wanted to thank my guests and uh, my teammate from Thanks. the fixer team uh, i really appreciate you guys uh, definitely your words your explanation it was just literally music to my ear because this is what we've been preaching and you just confirmed exactly what we've been talking about so i appreciate you thank you thank you and again look for us in our next session august the 6th Khaled with our friends at Fresenius with Mr. Bill Dezenzo. Perfect, and uh, Mark Carter as well. And um, again, I'm crossing my finger to have Mr. Cisco Vicente and Jason to join us. Now, just a note that uh, some of the questions that we did not answer, we will make sure to respond to those questions uh, accordingly. Ron and Melissa, we can't thank you enough from Johnson & Johnson. We'll talk to each and everyone on the, on the call very soon. Stay safe, everyone, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you.